Hi, I'm Patricia. Welcome to the 35th episode of A Breath of Song. I'm so glad you chose to do this today, which is extra special because Lisa Forkish is joining us for a songwriter conversation. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hi, Patricia. Thank you so much for having me. Zusa Gonsalves once said to a group, these are powerful things I'm hearing that you're already doing. We're here to find powerful wellness, one song at a time. Trust me, your voice is just the ticket for this. I'm coming to you straight from my home in what is now called Vermont, which is on the unceded lands of the Abenaki. And Lisa, tell us where you're calling from. I'm here on Kanaka Maui land um, in, on the Hamakua coast of Hawaii Island. All of our voices will turn up today just as they are. No matter what, we can feel the connection to our breath and vibration in our body. Let's find how good it can feel to sing. Last week I shared Lisa's song, Possibilities. Today Lisa will be teaching us another beautiful song of hers called Hymn to Loving. We'll learn it slowly so it can settle inside you and you can begin to trust it as a resource. Let it move you into a state of flow. Then we get to enjoy a conversation with Lisa and we'll close out with the song again at the end. You'll hear me singing along with Lisa as she teaches it to us and I hope you'll be singing too because that's the point of this podcast. So let's start with a good yawn stretch. Maybe roll your shoulders a bit. Mm. Or stretch into your back. Checking in with your body, whatever feels like it needs a little extra attention. Hmm. And noticing the air coming in and out. (sighs) Letting it find space in your body. Hmm. Letting it soften. Soften your face and your eyes. Let's allow some oohs and ahs to just release up and down your slippery spine. Maybe some scrunchy sounds. And some wide sounds. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you to share the song. Beautiful. Thank you for for the warm up there. All right. Well, so the song is called Hymn to Loving. And at first it was called Hold and Be Held because it's, you know, it's interesting titling a song because oftentimes the first thing that jumps out to you is is part of the lyric. And then I have to remind myself, what does the song want to be called? Not like, what what do I expect that it would be called? I'm not making commercial music, so I don't need to worry about, you know, people listening on the radio and knowing how to find a song, which is, I think, usually the logic behind how a song is titled. And when we think about how poems are often titled, where the title of the poem, those words appear nowhere in the text, um, it's, a, it's just a reminder to like really listen in to like what, what really is this song? What is the name? What is my name? So thinking, you know, sort of embodying the song and being like, hello, I, this is the song. What is my name? What am I called? <laughs> um, maybe perhaps like folks who, you know, wait to name their pet or even their child until they see them and can feel their energy and, you know, just... Um, calling that in. So that said, there's a repeated line in the song, um, hold and be held. And I was calling it that for a while. And, um, and I just had a moment, I think it was when I, I was hearing organ on this and I was hearing it like a prayer, but I, but prayer wasn't quite the right word. And I thought about, you know, what's a prayer in a song. And I, I think I even looked up the definition of him. Cause I was like, am I think, is this, is this, the right word that I want and I at first I was like him to love and then I was like no because yes it is a him to love but I'm really interested in in engaging in conversation with folks around love as a verb and I think when we hear the word love we hear it as a noun but if we hear the word loving it has this action almost attached to it like I learned the other day in um 
Hawaii, like there's some languages where that's just naturally a part of it. I learned in, in Hawaiian when you have the akina, the little like apostrophe, and I, um, and the letter I, that it makes whatever precedes it into an action. <laughs> like that's so cool. So it was someone explaining the meaning of Hawaii, that ha is breath and why is water, and then e embodies it, it makes it this actionable thing. At first, it sort of sounded like a weird song title, Hymn to Loving, but it just felt like it maybe just drew out more what I'm trying to get at, that this is a practice, that this is not something that we just sort of rest back in and know it always holds us. That too, and that there's something to engage with in the day-to-day. Adrienne Marie Brown is one of my favorite teachers and and authors, and uh, she asks all the time in her, in her work, what are you practicing? Mm-hmm. If we're looking at what we're practicing in the day-to-day, a lot of folks might be like, I don't know, I'm not really engaging in social justice work or movement work or social change work. And it's like, well, how are you living out each moment? And from her principles of emergent strategy that are all taken from the natural world, one of them is fractal. So it's this idea that small is all we need. So that's a little bit of the inspiration for the song or just the... Um, context of it actually wrote it while on a walk but I live out in farm country and so there's fields of uala a purple sweet potato crop or kalo and we have a number of cow pastures and goats and you know it's just very wide open on my walk down the hill I have the view of the ocean and it was uh, dusk and so there's this really magical light here at dusk And I had just had this experience with a friend. Um, There had been some possible harm caused in the relationship that we were sort of tuning into, you know, was this happening? And it was just this interesting moment, and it wasn't even in person, it was on Zoom. But where it just hit me in our work to deconstruct binaries and to remember that there's almost always a third thing, that it's not a this or that that I I think I was raised with a little bit of the notion of you're either the, you know, you're the caregiver and you're holding space for something. Even as a teacher, like we think, okay, I'm the one that's holding this and therefore I can't be held in it. Mm -hmm. Or the other way around. I am, you know, I'm surrendered in the arms of my beloved or I am I am here as a student in this space, and so I'm, I'm passive, and it's this being held by the learning environment. The, I mean, it could be anything, spirit, it could be water, it could be, there's so many things it could be that you're held by. But I had this moment with this friend where I was like, really, it felt like this simultaneous holding and being held. And that might not be a radical notion for some folks, but for me and the way that I was raised, it was very powerful to just realize I've been fed lies my whole life. Um, And as somebody who identifies as a natural caregiver, I I tend toward that role. I'm a cancer. I'm an empath. Um, I fall into that role of, of holding space very easily and have my whole life. It was kind of liberating to, to see the possibility in coming back into myself and seeing how I could be holding and held at the same time. And I I know you can't see me, this is a podcast, but it's like this visual of sort of resting in one's own body and sense of divine self and cared for and knowing that all is well and also able to offer that to another. And so uh, I took a walk and and this song emerged. It's not often that songs come as a download, you know, where it's like Mm -hmm. the song just arrives in one go. It's happened maybe, I don't know, three or four times in the 20 plus years I've been writing songs. So it's rare, um, but I have a very deep connection to this song because it happened in this way. I'm writing more songs outdoors away from my musical equipment, which is really powerful and changing the way I write. And that's probably plenty for me to say (laughs) leading up to it. Um, So this is the song. Uh, I think maybe I'll just do the first form because there's there's kind of like the bulk of the form and then there's this outro section that's meant to be, um, 
you know, extend it as long as desired and there are harmonies to add and play with and one could improvise over it if one felt inspired. But I'm just going to do the form one time so you can hear how the lyrics flow together and then I'll take each section one at a time and, and teach it. What if falling felt like flying? What if flying felt like freedom? Will I be healed? Will I be healed? Will I? What if freedom felt like living? What if living felt like loving? Will I be whole? Will I? And in living, I am you. And in loving, you are me too. Will we hold and be held? Hold and be held. That's the that's the bulk of the form right there. Mm. We'll maybe just take a breath, allowing that to settle in. And and the questions are intentional, you know, because I don't know the answer to the questions, but I think I think we we do in our body. It's one of those things that maybe words can't describe, but we can we can feel it. So the first verse is what if falling felt like flying what if flying felt like freedom will i be healed will i be healed so let's just do that much and the melody stays the same between the three verses the lyrics just change what if falling felt like flying what if flying felt like freedom Will I be healed? Will I be healed? Will I be healed? Yeah. And then the second verse, kind of expanding the, on that, what if freedom felt like living? What if living felt like loving? And I just want to say something about this verse. It's come to my attention that it might be controversial or spark just some, some interest because I was teaching it the other day to a group of singers in my We Sing community and someone said, you know, every time you sing that line, I flip f the words living in freedom. She said, what if freedom felt like living didn't resonate with her. She wanted to say, what if living felt, or what if, wait, what? What if living felt like freedom instead of what if freedom felt like living? And that was a really important thing for me to hear. And, you know, my response to that wasn't like, you're wrong in having that experience. Of course, the lyrics should land how, how they land with each individual person. And interestingly for me, when I wrote that, I was thinking that they're one and the same. What if freedom felt like living? It was this idea, like like our, our experience of living is just when we're like, oh, what does feel, freedom feel like? You know, people will ask that sometimes. What does freedom feel like to you? And if each of our human answers was, well, it feels like living. It feels like the day-to-day. -day. The day-to-day -day is that experience of freedom. But you could switch the words if that feels better for you. And then what if living felt like loving was the same idea. We could say, what if loving felt like living? It's both. For me, it's like you could just, it, you could swap either words and it's like they are the same. What if this feels like that? Well, then doesn't that feel like this? 
if this feels like that, <laughs> you could take that for, you know, put plug in any words there. So what if freedom felt like living? What if living felt like loving? Will I be whole? Will I be whole? Will I be whole? So let's try that much. Mm-hmm. What if freedom felt like living? What if And I want to say, too, like, the question, you know, will I be healed? Will I be whole? We are already whole, yeah, and we are. are Probably many of us are on that healing journey. So this third verse is, so in living, I am you. So in loving, you are me, too. And then, will we hold and be held? Hold and be held. So let's do that one together. So in living, I am you. Those are the three verses. Simple melody, I think. And there's this outro section, but if there's not time, I don't have to do the outro section. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. All right. So then from there, we go into, um, we actually pick up the tempo a bit. harmonies here. I'm just going to loop them one at a time and you can join in on whichever feels good. Hold and be held. Hold and be held. Hold and be held. Hold and be held. Improvise a little bit over this. Find your own words, find your own melody, either on text or just on syllables. Just get free with it. I'm going to add an additional part, but feel free to do you. Is this what freedom feels like? Is this what freedom feels like? What freedom feels like? Is this 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 what freedom feels like? 
what freedom feels like Is this 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 what freedom feels like? 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 We'll do one last time through this chorus together, breathing and So that's the song. <laughs> well, when we come back to it, we'll do it from the beginning through to the end, um, which we didn't get to do this time. Okay. Because I'd love to hear it continuously and give people a chance to sing it now that they have a sense of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm just thinking, if you have space inside you for it, could we do that right now? Just sing yeah. it from beginning to end? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's fresh in our minds right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good idea. Let's see. Take a sip of water. Mm. Okay, here we go. What if falling felt like flying? What if like freedom will I be healed will I be healed will I be healed what if freedom felt like living what if
freedom feels like hell. Is this what freedom feels like? 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 I describe A Breath of Song as a podcast about sharing songs that help us uncover the wellness that's already there inside ourselves. Singing is a way of helping us heal and adapt and grow. I'm wondering, why do you think singing is a healing modality in particular? You said something beforehand that made it sound like that, that you do think that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I resonate very much with the... Um with your mission statement of your podcast. Yeah, I th- for me, um, I think I could sum it up succinctly by saying singing is an expression of the self. The voice is a part of the body, so there's nothing external to be navigating. It, there's this purity of, of our own sound. And then even from a scientific perspective, we're now learning some more and more about the vagus nerve and that it actually connects to the vocal fold. So there is science that is telling us that it can regulate our nervous system. Um, But I think just that aside, I've known that even before that research without that singing is a healing modality. Um, yeah, it's an, it's, it's a part of, it's a part of us. And I think it can feel so vulnerable, but I think teaching us to surrender to that truth that's inside of us is a great practice for then being out in the world and being human. (laughs) You mentioned briefly, as you were introducing the song, your group We Sing, which is a group that is uh, both a singing group and a racial justice group. And I'm wondering, and I so wanted to be a part of it that I was willing to stay up way past my bedtime, (laughs) hours past my bedtime to participate here on the East Coast. I'm wondering whether maybe that that ability to open up our vulnerabilities, whether that's part of why singing and racial justice work can be so intertwined, or if you'd speak to that. Yeah, yeah, and actually, um, you know, we're, we're almost shifting our our work. It, certainly racial justice is a part of it, and I, I think that the work is becoming more broad just around liberation of of all beings but of course Mm -hmm. we we in understanding what we need to do to live in a world that works for everyone um Mm -hmm. and a world where all beings are liberated from the systems of supremacy and oppression we have to look at who's most impacted so racial justice is is certainly a part of it i've been working with an organization called holistic resistance for the past year and they're facilitating racial justice healing through the lens of of trauma and grief and understanding how our bodies have been racialized speaking of just like talking about something mm-hmm. as a verb like race is almost mm-hmm. it, we need to think of it as like a verb this is a social construct and something that we're playing out yeah. every day one of the things i've learned from them is closeness and relationship is is a way to to see ourselves in one another. And that's, I think some of the, the previous methods of, of getting at racial justice and trying to like explore how we can be better ancestors, better, better white folks living in these bodies. We're descended from colonizers and slaveholders, many of us, myself included. For those who are in white bodies, we have a traumatizing ancestral lineage. And so understanding how we have to find compassion for ourselves and understand that we are part of whiteness, but whiteness is not us. And so I think the 
where singing comes into that and where it feels so healing is in practicing this vulnerability and practicing how music can be a connector, it can be a bridge. It's not a bypassing. I, I've seen a lot of singing spaces where singing is used as, as like a bypassing tool to be like we're all one and I don't mm -hmm. see color and I'm going to just look across at you and sing in harmony with you and everything is right in the world. And it's not going to work that way because uh -huh. we have to actually acknowledge the harm that has happened. But I think that through music and the way that it gets us to this sort of core of self and this vulnerability that I think whiteness doesn't teach us how to do. I mean, white folks, we are living, the culture of white supremacy is incredibly restrictive for us. So the liberation of black folks in particular, but all folks of color, part of our liberation is tied up in that. And I think as, as we start to see that and we see that song is, is a really beautiful way to connect us. It's not, we are the same, it's we're different and we can sing in harmony. And we can name that and we can see our sameness. That it's both, again, one of the cult, I mentioned binaries earlier when talking about the song, but in the culture of white supremacy, this, um, this document that was created by Tema Okren after many years of research, mostly looking in, um, in uh, I think, more like workplace settings, but still, I think it happens interpersonally as well. One of the tenets of white supremacy culture is either or thinking. So be able to hold, I'm different from you and I'm the same as you and it's both. <laughs> and I think song allows mm -hmm. us to hold some deeper complexity, singing and song. I was thinking also about the, the embodiment that happens mm. when you sing, that when you sing, you actually connect and become aware of your own body, or, or you don't. I mean, you can, you can mm -hmm. sing in many different ways, right? It's possible to sing in, in unembodied ways, but I certainly, for myself, as I've been finding my voice as an adult, as somebody who did not sing and thought mm. I could not sing and was told not to sing, it, for me, singing has been a way of learning to be vulnerable with myself, learning to feel myself, learning to feel my mm -hmm. own body, learning to um, learning to listen to my own voice without judging it immediately as wanting, and trying to find ways of accepting mm -hmm. my voice as it comes through. And I've, as I've over the last couple of years, along with many other people, been doing more reading about how do we, how do we move forward? What what changes could happen? Where is there space? Where is where is my role in this? How how can I contribute? Yeah. That it has seemed to me that there's a there's a connection. There. Yeah, yeah. A, a wounded a healing mm. of wounds through recognizing one's own voice. I appreciate you so much, you know, n naming the, the embodiment aspect of singing, and I think that is a huge piece, and I might have mentioned, that I repeat this quote often, because it, it's, I think about it every day, so I, you might have heard me say this in our Weesing Circle last spring, but I got the chance to study with Rev. Angel Kyoto Williams, who's a, um, a Dharma practitioner, a Zen priest, and black queer activist and, and author. She's she co-authored um, Radical Dharma, which I'm reading right now and highly recommend. And she, she said, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said, um, if we're not in our bodies, we can't be responsible for what we do. And if we can't be responsible for what we do, we can't be accountable to those actions. And if we can't be accountable, there can be no justice. And at the time, what had happened recently in the world. I'm forgetting her name, but I know her trial is happening right now. The police officer who shot Dante Wright, right. intending to pull her taser and yeah, pulled her gun instead. Right. So Rev was, Rev Angel was naming, if that police officer was in her body, <laughs> she would have pulled her taser and, and not mm -hmm. her gun and Dante Wright would be with us. And so I think for all bodies, it's important, but especially those of us who live with positionalities that are more dominant in our current paradigm, that it's important to look at how us staying in our bodies and aware of how we move through the world, and not just our actions, like, I mean, that's a very dramatic example, but just what comes out of our mouth. Are we thinking about what we're saying? Are we aware of the spaces we're in? And I think, for me, there's no better tool to arrive in my body than singing. And I know a lot of folks in my circle feel the same way, that it's like, 
other embodiment practices or even sitting meditation is hard for me, but I can sing and it feels like, ah, here is the present moment. And otherwise I'm not able to find that. And some of that is, is the, the you know, these systems of capitalism and patriarchy and, and white supremacy that have just like taught us to be really disembodied. We've been completely conditioned to yeah. live outside of us. So it's, it's returning to this really primal ancestral core place in ourselves when we sing. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with your own voice and how it may have evolved throughout mm, your life? Yeah. Yeah, I love that you asked that question because it's a, it, we, we all, I think, I, I don't think there's a singer on this planet or a human who sings, which is hopefully more and more of us, who doesn't experience a journey with their own voice. And I had a vocal cord injury in 2014 that really changed my life. So I would say my relationship with my voice right now is probably more kind and tender and stable in that way than it probably ever has been because I, I went through that. And, you know, it's been now almost eight years since that happened, but it was so humbling. It was so, it was like, what would my life be if I couldn't sing? And it was a year and a half or so that that was the reality. And then just the whole process of healing. And I still have a vocal cord injury. So it's learning to live with a different version of my voice and love it. I was listening to an episode of On Being yesterday, a recent episode that's part of their Future of Hope series. And it was an interview with Liz Gilbert. And she was saying, you know, the things are our most painful moments, our deepest times of suffering, like when we're in it, we're in it and it's hard and we don't want to be told there's going to be a lesson and everything happens for a reason. And, you know, but on the other side, often, you know, she said, if people are naming the three things that shaped the person they are today, it's usually not periods of total joy and gratitude and immense satisfaction with one's life. And I absolutely would name that vocal cord injury. It got me on a healing journey around everything. It wasn't just my voice. That was when I started reading Brene Brown (laughs) and understanding more about vulnerability Uh as courage and not vulnerability as Uh weakness, which is what I had been taught. And yeah, it's been a journey of, of learning to, to love myself very fiercely through, through loving my own instrument and knowing I can't change it at this point. It is what it is. I've got this edema on my vocal folds and, and it makes the quality of my voice different. And yeah, just self-acceptance has been the lesson for me. Yeah. That was a cute sound. The <laughs> cat's right next to me. She's just sneezing and she's spraying all over my arm. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Um, yeah, the pandemic, of course, thinking of shifts that happened over the last eight years then since that time. For you, the pandemic was an unexpected and huge upheaval in all of our lives. And during that time, you combined it with a relocation, right, from the Bay Area to Hawaii. How has that experience been for you? Was singing part of that transition? Was what do what do you want to yeah, tell us about that? Um, it was it was very challenging in a way that I I didn't expect. Um, it was probably going to be challenging no matter what. But making a move in a pandemic, uh, I know a lot of people have done it. You know, you can't have a housewarm par- party with the neighbors and and meet new friends, and then you meet people maybe on the street or at the grocery store, and you feel a connection, and you want to be like, let's go for coffee, and then you're like, oh no, wait, that's not a thing, and so, and we're on an island, literally, so it's very isolating, like m- many folks, or I'm sure some other folks. The pandemic also sent me into some very deep shadow work and trauma healing work. Is not really by my own choice. It was just sort of like, okay, I guess this is when I'm going to do this. <laughs> I don't think anybody really chooses to do that. It's work. like it there it is. It's like done. it's sort of I can't. I can't and, keep living yeah. my life unless I I look at this stuff. So you know that combined with with a big transition, and I I moved here just a year after ending my marriage. I was in a relationship for 12 years, married for eight, and it was a year later that oh. that the pandemic happened. And I also moved just two months after leaving a job I had been at for 10 years at Oakland School for the Arts. So it was a total like burn it all down to the ground and rebuild it from scratch. And and then I'm watching that happen on a global scale, you know, both literally with climate change stuff yeah. and, and of course, figuratively. And so it's been a very deep 
powerful time. And the energy here on this island, because we have an active volcano, is very, it's very intense. And I knew that before coming here because the times I had visited had always been, I was here for, you know, 10 days at a time and it would be completely transformative. I decided I needed to end my marriage when, while being over here. And it was singing that was happening. So the, it was singing that brought me to this island, working with Rhiannon in her workshops. And that's what introduced me to this place and the culture and, and the language and the practices. And I just felt like, okay, the, and this is where I want to be. And my, my partner is, is into agriculture and it's a beautiful place to be into agriculture. And we have a little fruit farm that we're, uh, that she is tending to, I should say, I'm not, I'm supporting in some ways, but she's the farmer. Um, <laughs> But I, I guess what I want to say to sum up about how singing was involved, like singing brought me here, but when the pandemic hit, I immediately, to sort of to my surprise, um, I didn't miss a week with my choir. We went straight to Zoom. And it was really hard for the first year. I was just doing drop-in, and there were some nights where it'd just be one singer, and most nights not more than four or five but I was just committing to showing up every week for my community and hoping and knowing that other folks were going through what I was going through and that the ongoing invitation, one Wednesday you might wake up and go, I need to sing, and knowing that this space was there. You know, I had 35 plus folks in my community mm -hmm. when we were in person and it went down to, like I said, five. So singing kind of held me through yeah. it. Even when I w could hardly get out of bed, was suffering with depression, major anxiety, like I said, deep trauma healing, all sorts of challenging life stuff, mid-move, you know, makeshift gear setups every Wednesday. I did this song circle. So mm -hmm. I think it was, I realized at one point, mm -hmm. I'm like, I think this is like the only consistent thing that I've built for myself through. The, it was a through line, right? Mm -hmm. From my mm -hmm. life in Oakland to my life here. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny, as, as choral directors, as group facilitators, we often talk <laughs> about what we can control or what we can create or how we shape space and so forth and <laughs> what we imagine we control. I know you've continued doing this group. This group's been a through line and now it's evolved. And can you tell me about something that has surprised you recently as a singing Yeah, facility? yeah. Um, I love that question. And I think what came up for me um, when you first said that is, is related to what I was just talking about, sort of a continuation of it, that, you know, we moved to Zoom and, and you know, I got so many emails from folks that were just like, keep me on your list, let me know when there's another in-person thing, which now, you know, two years into it, <laughs> it's like, um, things, have, things have changed and more <laughs> folks are like, all right, well, this is the only way I can sing. But I think I've been surprised at how good we are at adapting, you know, we, like, our, our species, and I, and I know that, and I know that that's another thing that we learn from the natural world, and is actually another one of the principles of emergent strategy that I spoke to earlier is adaptation. And gosh, that there are just millions of ways that we have all had to adapt, but that have maybe ultimately been in really beautiful and sort of necessary, important ways. And so I think what surprised me recently is the last couple circles that I've had, an eight-week circle and then a six-week circle, have been so tender and a lot of tears, like the good kind of cleansing tears. And there are some days where I close my laptop at the end of our Wednesday evening. I go, I can't believe this is happening on Zoom. But here we are, and we're in this, and mm. we need each other. And we're remembering, we're knowing more than ever that we need each other. And whereas before, getting on Zoom might have, or even in the beginning, the first year, I think it was like, oh, I don't know about Zoom singing. And now we're just, I keep hearing folks say like, wow, I'm like, I can feel, I feel us singing together because it's all we have. And so we're learning to feel mm -hmm. into energy mm -hmm. that, at least in my case, uh, it spans across an entire ocean, the largest ocean <laughs> that there is. And I'm just thinking, even that, yeah. like sometimes I think, yeah. wow, there's like a cable running through the bottom of the ocean that's actually making this out or whatever, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it is really yeah. incredible. And that's what has surprised me is, wow, we can have this level of yeah. deep, interconnection and closeness and vulnerability where folks are just looking at a computer screen with tears in their eyes and feeling held and 
Yes. In the beginning, I was like, this is just a makeshift thing that'll get us through for the first few months. And two years in, I'm like, this is saving our lives. Yeah. And it's a really beautiful practice. I find the same thing with my mm. pocket songs group. The development of the connections and and the tears and the vulnerability and the willingness to be really mm. present with each other. In some ways, I think, so before this all happened, I was seeing a therapist virtually. She was in New York City. And I found through those appointments that there was something really lovely about being in my own space to do the healing work, wrapped in my own blanket with my own animals around me and the smells of my space, my rosemary plant mm -hmm. close by, all of those sorts of things. And I think in some ways maybe that's happening for I know some of my singers have said similar things. There they are in their own spaces, and they can feel both really vulnerable and really protected yeah. and really safe in a way that when, they're, when we're in a room together in a, you know, mm -hmm. a church basement somewhere or you know, some other space, and everybody's energy is right there mm -hmm. in the room side by side, in some ways that feels less protected yeah, than the way people yeah, feel absolutely. now. Absolutely. I, I think this year, the, the past two years, I have learned more about trauma and how it lives in the body than in all the years leading up. I've you know, a lot, taken a couple of classes and done a lot of intentional um, reading and listening. But yeah, our, when we're in real time, of course it can still happen on Zoom, but vulnerability is not something to take for granted. We can't just like turn on the button. We have to feel safe. And, right. and there's so much yes. talk about, you know, I'm creating a safe space, but it's like we can't control what's safe for another person. We can be trauma-informed and we can, as Beth Strano says, create brave space. But safe space is not up to us as, as the holders of space because we don't know what everybody has experienced and we don't know um, what they're grappling with in that moment. You're right. When we were in person, it's like you are, and if you've got 30, 50, 80 singers, that's a lot of folks trauma and and energy and uh and you know just human stuff in one room <laughs> in one space yeah. yeah which is also really powerful and beautiful that you're right that the the comfort of your own yes. home to have the sensory you know and I'm often able to do that as we're doing embodiment practices in my circle I'll say okay just take your eyes away from the screen and orient yourself to the room and notice a couple of things that you see and touch something that feels comfortable to touch. And we could have never done that in a church basement. <laughs> it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been as regulating right. as it is when we're in our home space. So then right. it allows for the sense of safety that probably yeah. then supports us in deepening our, our practice with singing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Rhiannon, so we have overlap in the vocal improvisation community. We know some of the same people. And you make space for people to improvise in this song. And I'm wondering if you could describe vocal improvisation for our listeners, some of whom may have not run across it before or never thought of it as something mm. that they could do mm. themselves. Who may, some people may think of vocal improvisation as the realm yeah, of the experts. Yeah. And I did, I did as well. You know, one thing I say to my improvisation students who come to me or just folks in my circle when I'm inviting improvisation in, which I'm just integrating it all over the place more and more because I'm remembering that it is a very human practice and sh must not be left to the experts because of how, uh, exactly. how liberating a practice it is. And I'm like, I'm in, I'm in the business of liberation work and improvisation is an incredible tool. And I am a graduate of a music conservatory and like to say I'm a recovering music elitist. <laughs> and I was conditioned to think there was a right way and a wrong way. And, and that it was, you know, you had to really have a certain skill to be able to do it. And I was always so shy about improvisation. And I studied jazz, but I just, mm. I never felt good enough. I had a lot of kind of wounding from my high school jazz choir and then jazz improv classes in college. So I think what I've come to now, um, you know, in part thanks to my work with Rhiannon and a lot of work on my own, I've done a lot of solo improvisation work, just like me improvising in a room by myself. Though improvising with others, there's nothing like it. I think it's one of the most magical and incredibly nourishing things 
of all time. And the solo work is, is very sacred to me too. Yeah, what I've uncovered is, well, as Rhiannon would say, there's music right in front of us at every given moment. We just have to find it and tune into it. And I would say that there's song in each of us that's maybe partly in here and partly out here if we're, you know, just looking around our space and tuning into what's there. I try to keep my eyes open, which is something else I learned from Rhiannon is, you know, the, the ideas and the inspiration are outside of us as well. I don't know that I have a quick elevator pitch on, you know, what I believe improvisation to be, but I would just reiterate that I think it is a liberatory practice. I think it is an incredible um, tool for understanding ourselves and learning to trust ourselves which if we don't know how to trust ourselves how can we trust another right and we need to build trust in order to move this world forward and we have so little of it among ourselves and so much division and so I, I don't know I, I believe it to be a tool for social justice and collective liberation actually I feel very strongly about that That's and beautiful. and that if you can sing you can yeah do vocal improvisation. You can improvise with your voice, right? And children do it. You know, we watch children do it with such yes. ease. It's just something that's, that's unlearned or, you know, beaten out of us over the years. Gosh, for lack of a better way to put that. Yeah, it's, it's innate, I believe. Yes. So some people will know of you, although they may not realize it, from mm. the movie Pitch Perfect. Can you tell us about your connection? Yeah. Um, I... I sang in a group in college called the VC that was an all female identified group. And we were kind of at the beginning of the rise of contemporary acapella in the scholastic world, starting in college. And then it took over high schools and replaced vocal jazz programs everywhere. Um, and my group had a really interesting story and we were considered one of the pioneers of, I mean, now it's just so interesting because we're moving away from gendering everything hopefully but especially you know the singing world and choirs and acapella groups but at the time it was still very gendered there weren't a lot of you know mixed gender spaces it was mostly it was like you were a female group or a male group <laughs> this feels so archaic to be saying right now this was mm -hmm. 2004 to 2006 <laughs> um not that long ago but it's like so much has changed in that amount of time um I would never yeah. speak this way <laughs> now but but at the time it was very we were doing radical things with our sound and we were proving to the contemporary acapella world that women don't need men to sound good <laughs> with each other, which is like, um, okay. Uh, but at the time it was very <laughs> radical and we had a really interesting story and a, a writer from GQ magazine uh, decided, I guess kind of caught wind of this growing contemporary acapella movement and decided to write a book about it and decided that he would chronicle the stories of three different acapella groups from around the country, and one of them was us. So I was, I was at Berkeley by this point, but I, got, I remember like standing outside the Whole Foods on Berkeley campus getting interviewed by this writer. And, and so there's a book called Pitch Perfect that's nonfiction and reads like a GQ magazine. It's horrible, and the way they talk about women is horrible and misogynist and problematic, and he kind of you know, twisted our story a little bit, but it's closer to the real story. Universal Pictures did even more of a number. But then Universal Pictures bought the rights to the movie in 2010, and they decided of the three groups that are highlighted in the book, they were going to tell the story of the all-female group, Devisi. So when I went to see, I've only seen the film ones. I went to see it in theaters, actually with my students <laughs> at the time. They were like, you're, this, you're the inspiration for this movie. And I was the music director, so everyone's like, oh, did you vomit on stage? And you know, like all this I was like, she's not based on me. Um, but uh, yeah, it was very bizarre because there are a lot of things that are really taken from our story. And then, and then the whole ending is entirely different. So it's, it was a strange thing. And I was actually asked to be a part of the movie and then they changed their mind. And which I found out later was because they were going to change things and they didn't want somebody who knew the truth to be stepping in and saying, this is what's up. And it's kind of oh severed a relationship goodness. with... A, a person, a connection that I had in the acapella community around that, which I'm not sure that I've ever spoken out loud, but yeah, it's, it was, it was an interesting thing. They wanted, I think they wanted to bring me in because they were like, you're the person that should tell the story. And then they're like, mm, actually we're not going to, you know, which just happens so often in, in film. 
I was going to say, it, it, yeah, that seems like that's yeah. a story I've heard over and over again from people involved with the film world, where people have had their books adapted, where it was, in the beginning, everything sounded wonderful, and then all of a sudden they got no more calls, and then the film came out, and they're like, yeah. that's not yeah. my book. What did you do? And you changed the one thing exactly. you promised not to change. And they cut you out you of know, the process because um, they know you're going to kinds of things. Yeah, speak up. They, they mm. know you're not going to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to share before we go into the lightning round questions? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think just, yeah, just loving this conversation. This all is, I guess I'd just say, you know, um, things are changing a lot and I'm feeling that, I mean, I would not have had, I, I, you know, was interviewed for different kinds of podcasts two and three and four and five years ago, very different kinds of podcasts and the conversations, you know, of course it's still me, but I've changed so much and my priorities have shifted and I'm just, I'm grateful for these kinds of conversations and for you bringing this awareness um, in in a digest, easily digestible form to the masses through this podcast. And I'm not sure it's the masses. I'm not sure <laughs> well, the folks masses have access yet. to it. <laughs> but the people who have, yeah. yes. <laughs> I have a wonderful listeners. The listeners are well, just Well, thank you, fabulous. listeners. Thank you for listening and, and keep spreading the word about this beautiful mode of, of healing and wellness that, that we're uplifting here today. Yeah. So lightning round questions, quick questions, okay. quick answers. What's an album that was really important to you? Uh, Fiona Apple title. What is your favorite soup? Um, probably like a curry lentil with vegetables. Yum. For Apple Podcasts, we're not allowed to use any curse words or else it will get rated <laughs> differently and people won't be able to find it. So what is your favorite replacement <laughs> curse word? Um, I love this question a lot. And I, I, um, the first thing that comes to mind is ridiculous, but probably if I'm being honest about what I actually use in real life to replace a curse word, it's poop. I just will be like, ah, oh, poop. Ah, <laughs> oh, poop. <laughs> poop. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is a sound that you feel strongly about? Wind chimes. Mm, do you love them or hate them? I love them. Okay. <laughs> I love them. I have two. I have a wooden one in my back that gets some winds, and I've got some beautiful metal ones in my front. <laughs> nice. Nice. Who is an artist that you wish more people listened to? I love that question. Um, and I think... I, there's a lot of folks I'd want to name, but I think probably the top name that comes to mind is uh, an artist called Crystal Warren. A singer. Crystal spelled? Uh, yeah, it's K-R-Y-S-T-L-E, okay. Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N. Yeah, an okay. incredible singer-songwriter. Is just more people should know their music. <laughs> and finally, where can we find you and follow your projects or buy your music or mm. be engaged with you? Yeah, um, I'm on Bandcamp, which is where I like to send people because they really support artists. You buy my music on Apple and I might see like a couple of cents at some point, but Bandcamp is um, an awesome platform and you can find all of my albums there and I'm going to be putting out new music soon. I'm working on a new album right now and also some some singles. And then my website, just lisaforkish.com. Um, I'm actually in the process of a redesign, so I'm going to have a brand new website in about a month. Um, that I'm really, really excited for because, I, as I said, a lot has changed, and so it feels like it's going to really lift up um, the current, this what I'm up to <laughs> in the world. But yeah, you can find uh -huh. info about my classes and song circles and all of that on there. Wonderful. A huge thank you to you, Lisa, for coming on A Breath of Song, and a huge thank you to our listeners. As we already said, I'm so glad you're singing with us. Let me remind you that your review on Apple Podcasts helps people we don't even know yet find the show, and you sharing with your friends really matters. Visit abreathofsong.com to see lyrics, Patti Piotrowski's glorious artwork, sign up to get artwork and music in your mailbox, how beautiful is that? Suggest a song or a songwriter for the podcast, and leave something in the tip jar to help cover costs. Before I Get Paid, 25% is donated to the Jazz Foundation of America, which directly supports jazz, blues, and roots musicians in need. The skill and the artistry of these musicians has directly shaped most of the music I share on this podcast, yet historically they have been inadequately recognized and unfairly recompensed by people in power. 
So that's a small gesture toward writing that. Mm. Let's sing Hymn to Loving again to help our brains remember it. Of course, you can always download this episode and listen as many times as you'd like. Lisa? What if falling felt like flying? What if flying felt like freedom? Will I be healed? Will I be healed? Will I be
freedom feels like Hold. Is this what freedom feels like Hold. Is this what freedom feels like Hold and be held Hold and be held Is this what freedom feels like? Such a beautiful question. Thank you for joining Lisa and me today for a breath of song. I'm grateful that you're taking care of yourself and listening to your voice. I believe making a better world starts with tuning in to ourselves and each other, which is what we just did. So yay us. <laughs> if you're liking this podcast, please share with a friend and next time we'll plant another song. Be well. Awesome. We can stop the recording. <laughs>